and we're back for another episode uh, today. I'm joined by Professor Alexander Villian, who is now at the University of Washington. Excited to have her join in today. Um, many emails back and forth from her from a plane. So it's very, <laughs> every email I got, it seems like she was on a plane. So it's really funny, um, but very uh, grateful to have her here today. <laughs> Well, I'm very grateful for the invitation, Aiden. I think this is uh, just such a cool initiative that you're spearheading, and um, I'm really honored to be one of your guests. And yeah. it is true, I only answer emails when I'm flying, but I do fly a lot, so uh, I'm not sure that's such a good thing. But, uh, but uh, I've been, I've been, um, you know, uh, I'm very grateful to have been invited to give seminars at yeah. all sorts of wonderful uh, places. So, yeah, excellent. Yeah, with, I guess. Excited to have you here. A lot of conferences, a lot of chemistry today. We'll be talking a lot of chemistry today. Um, broadly speaking, you know, you're a professor in kind of the inorganic division, but specifically um, into, um, you know, structurally fidelity of like an atomically precise active size for like heterogeneous catalysis. And we'll definitely talk about that in, in, in uh, due in, uh, in good time. But perhaps maybe we should start a little bit about your background. And so... Actually, I know you're, you know, grew, kind of grew up in Romania, um, which yeah, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it's not too often I meet Romanians. So I really, honestly, I really don't know anything about the, the culture there, or cuisine or anything like that. So I don't know if you want to enlighten us a little bit about kind of your background, you know, where you grew up in Romania. Um, and sure. Yeah. I, um, uh... Um, I mean, Romania is still home. It's funny. I've been living in this country for many, many years and I'm a, a U.S. citizen by now. Um, but, you know, for Americans, I'm Romanian. And if I go home, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Romanian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but to me, Romania is still very much home. Um, I, I was born um, by the river, like the song says, uh, in, in a small city by the Danube Delta. It's called Tulcea. And so that's basically where the Danube River flows into the Black Sea. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, to me, it's a special place. And I think yeah. there's a lot of really good fish there. So that I really miss, <laughs> it's especially yeah. the way people compared it. My, um, my grandmother's um, uh, brother was a fisherman. So let's just oh, say wow. they, they knew fish. So <laughs> yeah. that's one thing I really miss there. Um, but then, Sometimes, um, just before I started high school, we moved to Bucharest, which is the capital so, city. Mm. Uh, so it's a different beat there. Um, every other city I lived in, I've lived in since, except for New York City, has felt very provincial by comparison, mm. <laughs> because it was. But um, uh, yeah, it's a very vibrant place. Lots of uh, mixed influences. Um, you know, the... The language is actually a, a Latin-based language. Hmm. Uh, that there's a small percent-wise uh, Slavic influence, which you know yeah. makes everyone suspect that, or many people suspect that it's a, it's a Slavic language, uh, but it's not. So, yeah. uh, so you know, I think I think this this these mixed influences um, are felt in the culture very much. Like you have the former Ottoman Empire had a piece, and you know the hung uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and Anyway, so it's just lots of uh, a melange of, of influences there, which make for a very, I think, vibrant um, culture and people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the yeah, I was gonna say I was trying to think of because I, I pay attention to a lot of like European football, and I know you know <laughs> George Hot, yeah, yeah, Georgie Haji, um, your Romanian <laughs> legend. That's kind of the only one I really know. I know like there's some other one, uh, Popescu. Um, <laughs> Very good, very good. I'm uh, impressed. Yeah, gymnastics was also a really big deal. Of course, many people mm. uh, know of um, Nadia Comaneci, who was like a famous gymnast. She was the first one to get like only 10s at the, I think, Montreal Olympics or something like that. Oh, wow. So there are a lot of really talented and, and more current athletes, I think. It's, uh, they're, you know, talent is, is everywhere, but definitely lots of really, uh, really talented, very hardworking and very successful um, athletes but people of all you know inclinations um in romania just like everywhere else right sure talent is everywhere yeah. although opportunity is not so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, yeah opportunity and exposure certainly is not um yeah. hopefully that hopefully that'll change but um you know kind of growing up through romania uh, i guess 
I don't know how I don't know how big like chemistry is there, but it was um kind of coming up. Were you like always interested in STEM, um, in those kind of fields, or you know how did that kind of uh, curiosity for STEM grow? Yeah, I I, I really loved sciences. Um, it, the the curriculum in high school, at least when I was growing up there, was was very um, very good. Uh, <laughs> it, it really dove into physics and math and and sciences in general at much earlier stages and compared to most schools here i think it's of course i went to public school uh to public schools um and that that's at least used to be and i think still is the the main way people get educated at home and the best schools are public schools right so uh so i had that exposure early on but in high school i think um i also really loved uh like social sciences and and um we we did I had some wonderful teachers actually the high school I was in it's funny as I go to various schools at um in the US to to give seminars they pride themselves sometimes of being uh kind of old you know old schools and and I'm thinking my high school was uh started in 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 uh, six in the late 1600s <laughs> it's one of the oldest you know high schools in Romania that's uh uh is not, it's called Colegio Nacional Sfuntu Sava, and I'm, yeah. I'm always uh, smiling a little bit when I hear, uh, you know, of of, uh, of you know what constitutes being like an old school here. Wait, <laughs> your high school was built in the 1600s, and you attended? Yeah, that, that's what it, I think. The building itself was not, although you know, it's it's certainly uh, pretty old. Yeah, I, uh, health, but the the school itself was instituted in, in the in I think. Um, just shy of the 1700s basically I got you. a few years so 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 that was um yeah puts that is pretty crazy but anyway, it's, it's one of the most prestigious um of course public schools in in the country and in bucharest and i was um i had my eyes on it i guess i really wanted to go there because i heard that that's the best and and i you know i guess i was pretty ambitious back then and yeah um so I wanted to go there, but they had, the, you know, they just exposed me to so many wonderful things. Like um, I always loved reading, but we had, you know, a lot of uh, forays into literature, uh, universal literature, of course. And and I loved that. I loved philosophy. I loved, um, of course, sciences too. I was, I had kind of a focus in natural sciences mm. as I started high school. So that was something I, I loved um, back then as well. And yeah, I, yeah figured out that I wanted to, that I really liked chemistry um, pretty early on. And actually, I almost never talk about my personal experience because sometimes students ask me, well, you know, when did you know? <laughs> and I guess, it, you know, th that realization is different for everyone. And I don't know that my path is necessarily, um, you know, a reproducible prep. So, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, but I yeah. started going to, to, chemistry olympiads early on back then and, and sure. so that that gave me a different exposure that i just wasn't aware of and also as a first generation um to be college graduate you know mm -hmm. like I, we didn't, uh, I, I didn't get that much exposure of those kind of academic opportunities growing up um, mm -hmm. although my family was wonderfully supportive of all my endeavors yeah well a couple of things i wanted to ask is like something um you know what i don't know if there, are there things in romania that like, you kind of missed that you just can't get here in America because I don't even know. I don't even know in America if there's any like large Romanian populations anywhere. Like I don't know if there are. I'm sure there are, but like I just I don't know. But so, is there things that you miss yeah, about Romania? Like that I you mean, can't get here really. Time, after as many years as I've been here, I think the the one thing that stands out uh, is community. Um, it's mm. like you know, sense of belonging to a cohesive uh, kind of culture, right? Mm. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. About being in the states and in a university setting, there's so much variety. Um, but it's it's also nice to have uh, a family and people that you kind of grew up with uh, mm. around, and that's not a luxury that I have. Yeah, <laughs> especially now now in Washington, it's a you know Seattle, oh, Seattle, Washington. I mean, Seattle is a you know huge city, so it's a yeah. diverse population there. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but of course, just growing up in the same country, independent of one another, doesn't a community make, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, I'm sure, Romanian communities, um, in, and I know that there are in, in Washington as well, but it, that's not equaling being friends with them, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, so, 
Uh, something, something I definitely want to ask you about is you actually, you know, so growing up in Romania, but you did your undergrad actually here in the United States. So you actually went mm -hmm. to Caltech for your undergrad. What I'm curious is, I mean, at such a, I mean, what, that would have been 17, 18, right? I think moving, moving uh, over to the States, a little yeah. bit older, but uh, still, I mean, that must've been, well, exciting, scary. I don't know, like all at the same time. I don't know. That's awesome. Yeah. What, uh, you know, so I guess, well, how did the opportunity arise to go to, you know, what, what about Caltech kind of, um, brought you there? Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, well, how'd that go? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, be, I guess one of the perks of being at such a great high school as I was is, um, there were a lot of really hardworking and, you know, very successful students and, you know, you kind of learn from pick up bits and pieces of opportunities that are out there. And um, as I had started going to chemistry Olympiads, I became aware of the fact that, you know, a lot of people who did go to chemistry Olympiads and, you know, all these kind of international chemistry or other fields contests, they would end up applying to go to schools and abroad. I, I didn't want to do that because I guess um, I was very stubborn. So I thought uh, I had, the, you know, also like people tend to be at that age a bit idealistic. And I thought, um, uh, you know, if you want to do science, good science, you can do it anywhere. You know? Yeah, right. It just made sense at the time that it should be true. Uh, so I, <laughs> actually, I remember this funny thing. I had a, my best friend in high school. We're riding the bus together to go to, the, to school. And she's like, oh, you know, I bet that if we were in America now, we we would have boyfriends none of us had <laughs> and i was like solemnly telling her that i would never go abroad you know i will i would never yeah. go you know that was me and of course like you know here we are uh, many years later i live in the states and she's back home <laughs> yeah right um, but but you know i i, I really didn't want to leave and so i because everyone was going that route that i knew and i was like no 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 i'm going to give it a shot i'll stay at home and i did um so i actually enrolled at the university in, in Romania, but I realized that, I, I mean, it was the Chemistry Polytechnic Institute um, there, but, uh, you know, after a, about a month or probably from like day one, but I realized that it just wasn't what I actually wanted to do. I really wanted to do research, but the opportunities there, primarily due to funding, not, not talent, yeah. not a shortage, mm -hmm. uh, just it just wasn't there it wasn't going to be cutting edge and that's what I wanted to do and mm. so kind of on a last minute I I realized that I actually do have to apply uh, to go abroad so um, so I, I I took that chance and you know it was a little bit rushed many people prepare a lot longer than I had and so looking back I always <laughs> get a little bit nervous thinking how irresponsible it was of me not to you know to be to be so naive, I guess, thinking that I could just stay there and do the science I wanted. Uh, so I applied to <laughs> a handful of schools, very few, like Caltech, MIT, yeah. you know, Harvard. Like that, that because, you know, I was like, well, if I'm going to go abroad, I'm only going to go to places. <laughs> only the only the only the name brands. Uh, only only like four. I know. I mean, it's just it's just that you know, back then, like I had a dial-up connection at home. You have to understand, information was was shared very differently and uh you know um so i that's that's what i did and i remember submitting my caltech application like you know i was like on just barely on the deadline with my very slow dial-up connection and you know, i don't think anybody proofread my application <laughs> so uh don't do that so i i was i really feel very fortunate that somehow they they saw my application and they thought oh we want to have this person on board because mm. it changed my life. You know, they, they enabled me to go. Like I would have never been able to afford to go to a private school in Romania. I'll be not, not forget right. about the U S. Uh, so they, they made it possible for me to go there. And I think when you were, I was 19 at the time. And when I actually, my first flight ever was to travel from Bucharest to Los Angeles. And I remember that was it crazy. I know, I know it was, but that's what you do when you're 19. You know, I think, I think, uh, I mean, you know, I have a three-year-old daughter now and I, there's a thought of having, you know, my, my kid go like this into a diff different <laughs> country. Seems really, really scary now, but that, that back then I was like, I was like, yeah, this is cool. And, 
and it turns out, you know, you can figure things out. But it was funny because I knew that once I get to LAX, I have to take a super shuttle to Pasadena. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in my dictionary was the word super shuttle featured. <laughs> So I didn't quite know what the super shuttle was. And so, you know, I, I landed in Los Angeles past midnight, well past midnight, and I was supposed to get to, you know, Pasadena on campus and get the campus security. And so, so you know, it's, yeah, different. Did you know any English? Like how much English did you know? Yeah, yeah, of hmm. course, of course. Uh, okay. I had learned um, English. Again, I, you know, I, I must have known something uh, yeah. to make it that far, but I, that's true. But you know, it's not, it's not like I had ever been immersed in that uh, language. But mm. I was, I I guess people were nice, and I was like, okay, Caltech, and they're like, okay, Pasadena, this is the stop, and yeah, I figured out what the su super shuttle was. <laughs> yeah, I, I, honestly, I find no matter where you go, I, more often than not, you do get kind and generous people. Like I really do. I generally kind of believe that. Like you really do. People, um, that's right. There's definitely like, of course, there are like scary stories but like i've like those the for me i've only heard like few and far between for those but yeah. um well, those are the ones that get publicized right yeah right those yeah those are the ones you only, only ever hear about honestly but the other thing i wanted to mention about the caltech thing is it's like it just how important it is to to take a chance on people that um you know come from from backgrounds that uh, where where maybe they're not just the mainstream kind of applicant that would go to a a a private school of course caltech mm. is not exactly mainstream in any way but but it just it opened this wonderful uh these wonderful doors for me it, it it's kind of funny because going in there i thought oh yeah i mean i heard it's kind of a good school but i i didn't come in thinking wow this is as good of a school as of course caltech is and i i was like yeah it's sounds you know it's, it sounds like a decent place and then uh, yeah. my first my first class there um i i placed out of gen chem so i my first class with with was with Bob Grubbs. Oh, the late, great Bob history. Grubbs. Yeah. He's, uh, he was one of my favorite people. And, and, you know, um, a few weeks into our, um, into our class as a, a organic chemistry, um, his TAs are like, Oh, you know, we're going to cover, uh, for like a, a week or so, you know, the classes because professor Grubbs is, uh, is picking up his Nobel prize. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, that's, that's it pretty good place I guess. yeah so it was it was very special um in in so many ways and and um there were also a lot of romanians uh that had been through the chemistry olympiad sort of pipeline that uh were at caltech and that just um uh, that was great you know because it, it helped so much and uh, it made that place feel like home it was mm -hmm. just an exhilarating um for me it was a a, a wonderful experience and uh, i ended up working there of course um with uh with another romanian but i i, I eventually <laughs> yeah i had no intentions of working with a romanian but teo was just so cool that i couldn't say no so mm -hmm. and i don't yeah. regret it <laughs> i i think that's a very funny story like <laughs> taking the orgo with uh bob you know bob grubbs who um i i don't know if this is because so i grew up in, in the northeast in philadelphia and so i don't know if this is like a Maybe because I grew up on the East Coast and obviously like Caltech's over in California, but, and maybe this is also kind of a reflection of this chemistry community in general, but it's funny how like when I graduated undergrad and like was applying to graduate schools, like you feel like you're kind of like on top of the world in some sense. And so it's like, and then you kind of get into chemistry, like for as a graduate student, you're like, oh man, like I actually don't know anything yet. And so it's kind of like, it's really funny how like you meet these big names in chemistry like without like any and then like they're just like regular people but it's like i don't know to me it's it's a it's a weird phenomenon where it's like oh my god like like now like bob grubbs it's incredible but i can imagine yourself as like an undergrad where it's like um like i don't even know who this guy is and it's like oh he's picking up his nobel prize like i, I think it's just kind of funny to me you know <laughs> no but you know that the, the, the nice thing about coming in without a uh, preconception about how important a person is is that mm -hmm. uh you can just evaluate them for what you actually see right and that was the wonderful thing there i mean you know my my academic advisor doug reed uh a uh, uh, and so he's just amazing person and you know um also a very famous scientist but but just so approachable and um you know bob grubbs i mean i ended up teeing for him a couple of classes which is a huge honor for because i guess you know for me but 
but not because he had gotten the Nobel Prize, but because of the person who he was. Of and course. The teacher he was. And, and you know, uh, sometimes we'd have lectures and he's in his office because, you know, they're like, uh, I, I took a class with him, like advanced organic uh, synthesis. And and uh, it was a lab class. And I think there were like four people in, in the class, you know, because that mm-hmm. happens. And so we had lectures and he's in his office, you know. So yeah. I had the, the opportunity to, to meet these people that, um, sure, they were. They would have been intimidating at another age if I knew any better. But back right. then, they were just people that made a huge impression just because of who they were on a daily basis. You know, yeah. very approachable, very inspiring, uh, and and very supportive as well. And mm. and, and that's just so like one of the names. Of course, I um, actually my research career there started with. Uh, with this uh, a class that I'm actually implementing right now at the University of Washington, uh, meant to expose undergrads to research early on in their career so that they could see what their chemistry research is for them and how to approach it. Um, and so it was called Chemistry Frontiers. And so my freshman year, true to my initial intentions of doing research, I, I, I took this class and to figure out who to work with and how to learn more about what's out there. Um, research wise and uh, you know i i heard jonas peters speak about his beautiful chemistry and iron chemistry and uh i was really taken with it and you know i approached him after the class it's like a one one hour thing and a presentation that he would give and and uh i was hooked and somehow he you know he took a chance on me this undergrad that <laughs> you know was just starting um, and, and gave me a position in his lab to, to work. And, you know, I actually right there, I started working right away with two wonderful chemists and longtime friends that uh, Alex Miller, a mm. first year graduate student at the time, <laughs> his lab and, uh, and Neil Mancat, a second year graduate. Student. So they were my mentors. And so that was my, um, you know, my initial foray into inorganic chemistry, uh, experimental inorganic chemistry. And, and, you know, it was just, I mean, just amazing experience. Mm-hmm. As it say, I know you did. I know you did primarily undergraduate with uh, Professor Theodore Agape, Agapi. Uh, hopefully, Agape. Yeah. <laughs> Agape. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to tell me a little bit about like doing undergraduate research uh, with him, but also a little bit else about this this chemistry frontiers, I guess class because that does sound yeah. interesting. And um, yeah, maybe a little bit of details about that because that does. Uh, I don't really know. I'd love to share about that. I, I yeah. actually think it's something I am very passionate about. And as a, as a professor now at the University of Washington, which is uh, not a small private institution like Caltech, but uh, a really large one. It's a public institution that serves many people of all, you know, uh, box of life. And mm. well, not that the other one, not that Caltech doesn't, but, of course, but of course. It, it's just a different focus, right? It's a really large undergraduate program. And um, I, I guess, you, you know, I, Starting here, I realized that um, oftentimes undergraduates would reach out to me in their third year or fourth year even for opportunities to do research. And I I would love to take all of them if possible in, in the group because I, as if they if they are inclined to, to pursue in organic, uh, research in organic chemistry. But but at that point in time, it's, it's really hard to learn and really do something research-wise uh, because the training takes a long time. And so I felt like they kind of missed a boat there in in terms of taking advantage of the resources that the university has to offer. Mm. And so I view this as as a way to basically uh, an illustration of the leaky STEM pipeline where you're just sort of missing out all this talent, potential Mm. talent, um, because early on in their careers, they're not exposed to information. Things like basic things like graduate school is paid, (laughs) you know, you get the you don't have to pay for it because it, that's not a given to know, considering that law school or you know med school are paid out of pocket. Mm-hmm. So many of the kinds of students I I really think we should reach out to. Um, so uh, increasingly more uh, like first generation uh, students, you know, the kind of people that go home and they don't get all that advice or support network that that uh, more privileged uh, students do, right? Sure. I feel like that's, that's the place where we should really uh, focus on. And, and so if we could just get the information early to them, that would be great. And so we, but at the same time, you know, if when you start a new class and, you know, this job is really demanding, there are a lot of different hats one has to wear. So 
it, if you start a new class that, you know, on top of your other load, it has to be sustainable. So, so it can actually become part of the culture. And so I love the Caltech, uh, you know, this Cal, I, I took a lot of inspiration from the Caltech class that I took as an undergrad, Chemistry Frontiers, and I adapted it to the needs that I thought, um, and we continue to adapt, of course, as I learn better <laughs> what mm-hmm. the needs are at the University of Washington. But the framework is easy. Every, every um, week there's um, a PI and a, a, one or two students from the group or just a student, a couple of students, including possibly under an undergrad student presenting the big picture of what their lab does in chemistry, at, you know, research wise and the relevance to society. And then as well as the path to get there or something about what the research actually entails. Mm. Because of course, you know, I, I actually was really uh, one of the things I really was curious about as a, as a college student was, for example, uh, you know, brain sciences or, you know, yeah, but co- computational neuroscience or neuroscience in general. But when I sure. saw what the work entails, I realized that's just not for me, right? So oh, there's, I hear you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a discrepancy there. So I think it's really important to get this direct interaction between these freshmen or sophomore, you know, people that are really early on in their careers mm. to learn about uh, the different flavors of the research, not just their impact, right? Because um, I think that, because again, there's that gap between um, what we might care about or think it's fascinating, but what we actually want to do or are, are inclined to um, to do on a daily basis, that's a different mm-hmm. story. And then the second thing that, that this class uh, is aiming to, to, hand, to, to tackle is, is uh, just the opportunity to interface between undergrads and profs and graduate students. Because I think that um, at a really large public institution like UW, uh, you know, there there might be fewer opportunities compared to a place like Caltech, where, of course, the ratio of uh, grad students to undergrads and profs to undergrads is is um, mm. is really high. Yeah. Uh, so so I think yeah, I'm really excited about this, and you know, I think the it's a win win for the presenters. And every week there's a different team, and you know, the undergrads seem to be uh you know enjoying this and, yeah and i think of course this is not enough for, as a i'm actually the the chair of the um undergraduate awards committee which but with the support of the department and sponsors of the you know we we were able to uh kick a really uh nice way to to fund students over the summer students that have no research experience mm. so it's kind of a complementary effort and i was really excited when the committee and i we, we came up with this uh brand name the the, the chem starter <laughs> so our <laughs> <ter. laughs> <laughs> Uh, to to get uh, students that don't have research experience to get the full uh, full you know paid internship over the over a full summer mm-hmm. and and get them started and I yeah. think th- these are s- small steps but I think it, it really is going to make a difference and yeah yeah I think I think this is, I think it's a fantastic initiative I think um, just on the details of this a little bit because I what was, is this the first year you'll be running it or is this how like how long is this been um i think we started it so the first time the class <laughs> the chemistry frontiers happened at uw was actually the year of the pandemic when the pandemic oh, started well. <laughs> we had to do Rip. it virtually uh that was okay so 2020 was the first year okay. and so we, you know there have been there have been adjustments and sure ways to make it improve it and and so it's it's already going to be in its uh fourth year Mm-hmm. Uh, this year and, and going gener- to- generally what's been kind of the feedback because what i'm curious about is i don't let's say before chemistry frontiers in in that that course i don't know what the the undergrad undergrad demographic looked like as far as like majors wise because i know at least here in houston i'm sure this is kind of the same for a lot of public institutions you know you get a lot of uh like engineers or a pre-med yeah, yeah, biology type stuff so i'm what i'm what i'm very curious is you know how like what's kind of been the the feedback from them yeah. um, and do you generally get more buy-in like do you tr- do you like somehow get like transfers like do you transfer from people from like let's say a pre-med onto a chemistry track you know like have you like what's kind of been the this is this is just a a, a wonderful uh line of, of questions i think that we have to gather that data we have not yet Fair. um this is a, this is kind of a missing piece of the puzzle um i, I actually this year uh, an assistant professor is going to join this effort of you know running chemistry frontiers because 
because I think we need fresh blood and more, you know, uh, power to <laughs> to a- to answer questions like this and and take care of the logistics and so yeah. we have yet to gather that data and that's fair. I don't know what it's going to say, but um, I'm guessing it's not going to be a negative impact on all. Sure. This. So what's your um, what's your feeling though about? Um, I guess I guess how did you get the attraction for students? Because it's a credited course, right? It's credit or no credit. One credit, yeah. It's a one credit like course. I guess it's more of a lecture. I don't know if the students have anything. To, they just kind of show up, or obviously the people the people taking this course are already interested, right? So it's not like. Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. You, that was that's one of the things I learned. Um, so when you know, some of the years, I I was very proactive at uh, advertising it, and especially mm. to the people that I thought would. You know, we really wanted to show to, to, to provide that exposure to, and you know, we also advertise heavily to the to our um, you know minority office on campus and and you know all sorts of others. So we, we my my uh, graduate an undergraduate advisor uh, partner is is helping with a lot of this advertising, um, Casey Renenberg. But I, but but the one of the years I actually was just swamped and I, I started pretty late advertising the class and I, we saw a drop right in the enrollment. So mm-hmm. uh, you have to be proactive to get the word out there. And so although I do think it's becoming part of the undergraduate culture, it's not, you know, it's only like in its fourth year and it's course, a very yeah. small class still. It's not, it's not a, a you know, a solution for everything. So, oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think you're, yeah, you, you're asking good questions here, and you know we we've sometimes we've learned um, what uh, to continue doing <laughs> by not doing you know certain things like for example advertising early on, making sure that we get the word out there uh, for people to to sign up. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's fantastic. I mean, you know it, you know like you said, I mean it's hard to it's hard to kind of explain research to someone without kind of just doing like a full kind of lecture slash seminar. I mean. I, I don't know how you like advertise, you know, for people to like do research without that. Yeah. I mean, I'm well, sure professors kind of mention it kind of in like passing during their like, let's say organic. Well, I, but- I I should clarify that. I think there are many different um, ways that students do get exposed at the University mm. of Washington to research. I mean, we are in no shortage of people wanting to do research um, here. In fact, I would say that even before the class was even kickstarted, there were more students wanting to do research than feasible to host in a given lab. Wow. Okay. Uh, so I, I have to turn away around a lot of people. But the the specific problem that I thought um, we could address is making sure that uh, all students, including the ones that again don't get this information naturally by you know from their parents or families or whatnot. Right. Um, that they they would be made aware of this early on so they could learn whether you know what this is about and it doesn't have to be the outcome doesn't just have to be doing research in a lab it could just be knowledge about how chemistry is relevant in our daily lives Mm. uh, and the kind of problems that we tackle with chemistry Um, and you know ultimately i think um most of us can agree that you know university research has as its primary output uh, the students that it trains that go out there and tackle problems in industry or policy or whatever um, they might choose to do. So, so you know, uh, the being aware of these uh, these ways in which chemistry is wo- w- uh, you know woven into the fabric of of like the, our daily. Um, a life is is really critical to think about careers and and make those decisions early on and it does mm-hmm. not have to be involving research i just think that um it's especially important for uh for again people that that are first gen or you know like disadvantaged in some ways that they yeah. get the information early on and not just that but that they have um a way that is and the support necessary to pursue that yeah. path should they choose to do it and yeah. you know be given the confidence that they too can do it mm. yeah that's excellent yeah i think i i i love to hear this kind of stuff i you know <laughs> um i did like at my undergrad i did like i didn't really um i didn't really have anything like this but you know i kind of took some initiative on me to kind of start pursuing this kind of stuff but i could see how but 
this would be great for exactly what you're talking about. Like first gen students, um, let's say underprivileged too. like, just, just knowing yeah. that it's there is like right. more than half the battle. I think, you know, it's like, just, well, yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of work and also resources that are necessary to yeah. really tackle this. And, 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 you know, you're right. You need the data and there's a lot of data already out there and studies that are, um, actually trying to quantify or probe what actually helps versus what we think might help. Mm. It just feel good to do, but it doesn't actually move the needle, right? So right. Um, that has to be carefully thought of as well. And mm. the, the data on the output of like outcomes is really important. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see how this evolves really. I mean, I know you're four years in, which is not, it's just, that is not a lot. So, but like, it's a very exciting, it's, that's gotta be super exciting for you though. I'm, yeah, I'm excited I, I'm to see. I'm excited because, you know, the chemistry frontier now, there's a mechanism that can be improved, but mm -hmm. you know, this, this uh, bright and, and energetic assistant professor, Nick Riley at the University of Washington, who's, uh, who's going to help pick up uh, this class to take it to the next level. And then the fact that the department is so supportive of creating opportunities, like I was mentioning earlier, this funded, you know, chem starter, uh, fellowship for summer research uh, like that enables me to to tackle another you know kind of uh possible piece of the puzzle you know mm -hmm. to to move the needle on on this front so uh, so yeah so one thing I, one thing I want to so you you take you're in this chemistry frontiers at Caltech it exposes you to all sorts of chemistry I presume um what I am curious about though is obviously you take like most undergrads just because of how like pre-med kind of works is organic usually gets exposed first. That's just kind of just how it goes, but you're kind of in the inorganic. And so what I'm curious about is how did that kind of evolve? Like what, what about inorganic chemistry generally kind of spoke to you, I guess. And, um, so let me see if I understand the question. You're saying that, uh, there was a lot of type of chemistry that I was being exposed to what made me go into inorganic chemistry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think that is, a pre Caltech thing. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, I know I had this uh, chemistry book that I was using to uh, prepare for Olympiads. I loved organic chemistry as well. Uh, actually, it's funny the the author of this book that I really loved, uh, that where I learned in organic organic chemistry from as a as a high school student, was actually a Caltech professor. Oh wow. So, like a Hammond Hendrickson. Yeah. It's one of my favorite organic books, and I I learned I probably knew more organic chemistry back then, to be honest, than I do now. So. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so, uh, but, but that was really cool. And the, the inorganic chemistry one was like an Atkins, one of the, 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 the inorganic and PCAM Atkins, uh, books. And I really loved it. And I remember seeing like all these cool clusters and, you know, uh, element element bonds that you know were catenating like iodine, you know, chains. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. And, so I, I already had an inclination for inorganic chemistry, um, and you know, in, working with the, uh, with Jonas and his his team, and you know, there were so many amazing scientists. I mean, it's crazy. In that, just before I switched groups, m mostly because Jonas was moving to MIT, he had a, a short stint at MIT, and so he was he was leaving to to MIT, and so I had to switch groups. But I loved my time there. You know, again, I mentioned Alex Miller, but Connie Lou was there, Christine Thomas, Louise Bourbon. Like, it's just insane to think that in that short period of time, I overlapped with these amazing talent, uh, you know, and talented scientists. That's awesome. And then, uh, and, and then actually, I, I really thought I, I wanted to do something a little bit more relevant to, to biology, I guess. And, and uh, it I, I loved Jackie Barton. I still do. <laughs> I applied to for for uh for my second so in my second summer at Caltech I applied uh I had applied uh that that year prior for a surf like an undergraduate fellowship mm -hmm. to do a, a research internship in her lab and I I got it and I was really excited about it. Um but then I was also confiding in in what became kind of somebody that I I really respected. I was Teo Agapia, who was a graduate student in the Burka lab. And oh, wow. So I, you know, when I got there, everybody everybody in the Romanian community would tell me, oh, so you're a Caltech undergrad and you're a chemist and you have to work with Teo because every Romanian works with Teo. I was like, no way. <laughs> I was literally, I was like, I had no intention of doing that. And I, I, I mean, I absolutely, John Burka is one of my favorite people and scientists. Um, and I just, 
enjoyed working with him so much. But I, the, the kind of chemistry who was pursuing wasn't really what I wanted to do. And, and so I, I also did. That was another reason. But I was I was confiding in Teo one day and I'm, tell, I'm saying, like, oh, you know, I'm just concerned that I'll work in, in Jackie's group, but I the, the, the synthesis and inorganic portion of my work is not really what was interesting in the project, you know, which was, of course, uh, true, at least from the project that I was uh, I was looking at pursuing. And I also felt like because of that, it's not going to be intense enough. I know. Yeah. I'm, you have <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so I'm still fighting until this and, you know, a little bit of time passes and he's like, oh, we should have lunch. And so we, we grab lunch together and he's like, oh, you know, um, so it turned, I'm actually going to come back to Caltech as a professor after I do a postdoc. Uh, uh, so you don't want to, you want to work with me. I have like these three proposals. And if you, you know, you can, you can work for me instead. But I was like, oh, but I already have this internship lined up with Jackie. And uh, Taylor was like, oh, don't worry. I talked to her. She said that if I can recruit you, I can, you know, she's okay with it. All right. But, so that, that's how I actually um, started working with Taylor. So he, that year, uh, he moved to Berkeley to do his postdoc in the Marletta lab. And mm -hmm. I was hosted in, out of John Burka's lab, his PhD advisor. Um, so I had a hood there and, you know, Alex Miller had transferred at that time in the Burka lab as well. So he became kind of a, a mentor as well. But I was really the satellite Agapia group for a couple of years. So we had group meetings by phone and, you know, he showed yeah. me these amazing proposals. And and I was really, really fascinated by this idea that uh, pi, metal pie interactions can can be, I mean, you know, used uh, productively in catalysis and, and these bimetallic systems. And so I I took that on and, and uh, that, that's how we got started. And so for a couple of years, I was the only member of the Agapia group. Right. Um, so that was kind of an unusual start, but really well, fun experience. One thing, one thing I'm kind of picking up was like, the, the, I mean, how many people you've touched, like all the way from, just starting from a, a young undergrad till now is just a crazy, honestly. <laughs> they, it's a small they, community. Yeah. It's a small right, community. Right. And, and honestly, you know, yeah. It was definitely Actually a special cool. time. <laughs> so, so you're you're working through um, undergrad. Um, you know, the transition into graduate school. I assume was it kind of like a was it just a natural progression for you? Or, I mean, how did that? Um, yeah, that's work why out? I I mentioned earlier that I off I, I very rarely share my personal experience because it's just not. I don't think it's uh, it's you know the reproducible path that you want to set as an example it's kind of a fluke so i i remember uh, even in, during undergrad i i was concerned i was like what if one day i'll wake up and i won't love chemistry anymore what am i gonna <laughs> and so this is what's going on through my head right i i was really in it i i just loved it and i wanted to do that and i never i guess i never doubted that i wanted to pursue grad school and once i learned what that is of course and that happened yeah, yeah once I got to Caltech and and I just knew I wanted to do research and nothing else was like I I had a very focused view like I didn't even consider other options and I, I don't advise my students to do this because I don't think it's the way you know it works for some but if sure. you're in that category you probably are not going to seek that advice anyway but yeah I was really concerned I was like what if one day I woke up and won't want to do this anymore it, 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 and you know every day I woke up and I still wanted to do it and I and then I also realized, and I was more empowered to realize that over time, that if that happens, I have options and I mm. will not just keep going for, uh, as a result of inertia. Uh, so you always have a choice to walk away and do something else. You do. I, that, that is very empowering and there's a lot of freedom in that. So in you know during tough times in my PhD, I remember thinking just that, and I'm pretty sure there was one moment when I was like, oh. I'm not putting up with this. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, but obviously, I uh, that was not you know an, an actual. I, I love my PhD, and of course, of course, I yeah. But it's good to kind of have to to grow that uh, you know embryonic freedom of of thought and yeah, yeah, and so, create boundaries for yourself that help you um, ex you know grow into the person you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important for people to remember, especially particularly grad students, like, um, yeah, like you are not confined. Like if you go to graduate school, you're not confined to 
to see that out if that's not what you Absolutely. are interested in. And, you know? You know, I think, I think uh, at the University of Washington where, <laughs> I mean, that's just something that um, – we absolutely acknowledge it. And in fact, two of my early uh, students who were amazing, in fact, both of them Caltech undergrads, they're just two of my favorite people, Yuka Sakazaki and Christine Chang. And they both, uh, for different reasons, well, Christine Chang decided that she really loves data science as a result of a program she took while in my group um, through the Clean Energy Institute here. And she's like, oh, I love data science. And that's what she's doing now. Yeah. At PNNL and and Yuga Sakazaki for different reasons also realized that okay I mean she's done amazing work in our group and I I love her so much still and I I would have loved to have her in the group but you know she decided that a PhD program is not for her and now you know she she works at, as an engineer elsewhere and and that's great you know the, yeah. the graduate programs are here to enable uh, people to 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 put their best work and output out there and so. There's no stigma associated with it. Uh, certainly not in my books. I yeah. think that you should be here for the right reasons, and mm. uh, you should walk away and and you know apply yourself elsewhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I, I mean, I you know, I know a lot of students who like feel the pressure of like, oh, I'm I'm in this. I have to kind of see this through now. But that's kind of miserable, honestly. I, I wouldn't recommend that for for anyone. Uh, like, sure, sure. But I, I want to add a little nuance here. I think. Mm. Um, you know, graduate school is is challenging because you're kind of put through a grinder and reassembled as a scientist, as a, mm. you know, thinking differently, you're problem solving differently. It's meant to be an immersive experience. And that is uncomfortable because, you know, it's so much easier to just not really work hard. <laughs> they have those feelings at all. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. So so I think that we have to distinguish that from um, somebody who is in the wrong place. Right. No, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important to know that because, yeah, there there are going to be tough times, and I think that's can build character as well. Um, obviously, under con normal constructive ethical conditions. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, just, this, maybe this, let's go without that. saying, but yeah, right. <laughs> but I think uh, I think that it is meant to be an immersive experience, and you can't just go through grad school without really. Um, yeah, getting in at the deep end and and working hard and, um, yeah. Yeah, it, those are, those, are, those are great points. Okay, definitely this has is going to be it. a very geeky reference, but I always think about it as uh, Gandalf the Grey going in through this uh, cave, right, and like coming out as Gandalf the Wife. Right? Like, <laughs> that kind of growth doesn't happen without some pain. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Gandalf is that a Harry Potter reference? Gandalf? No, no, no. I think it's Lord of the Rings. Okay, I'm not a big. Uh, oh, yeah. I never Gandalf. saw Lord of the Rings, but. I don't, oh god! All the, everyone's yeah. gonna come after us now because I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, okay, we can cut this, right? Yeah, right. So, cut the anyway, cut, cut, cut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were before that, but masters in grad school. Uh, oh yeah, we were talking about grad school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I know that you were alluding to this transition from undergrad to grad school, and uh, I uh, you know I applied to some programs and and. Um, for me, it was it was pretty clear. Although I only made the decision at the very, you know, the last day, like I submitted Natural. my decision. Natural. Natural. <laughs> well, now as a as a prof, I don't see it this way. I'm like, why don't you just make the decision already? I need to know. <laughs> but back then, I was pretty nonchalant because I I was like, well, you know, who cares about this anyway? And apparently, people do. And but but uh, you know, once I met Kit uh, Kit Cummins, uh, my uh, PhD advisor. I remember I came in early and I saw one of his group meetings and we had this poster session and yeah, it really, I was like, okay, this is someone I can work with. I felt like we were on the same wavelength and I loved how he thought about science, mm. you know, and this, uh, the, it was just palpable, the, the passion he has for science, for chemistry and the creativity, the way he approached the science and, uh, so I, I tried to keep an open mind. I was there were some other groups that I was, um, you know, I thought there were there would be great uh, fits, but I, you know, I had to go with my gut, and and uh, I wasn't wrong. I mean, we worked really well together, and it was just I Kit is still one of my favorite people and uh, mentors that I uh, people I look up to. So it was, I mean, not that it was easy, right? Nothing worthwhile probably is, but but I grew a lot, and I I you're right that starting off. Although I was, 
quite experienced, probably more so than many undergrads starting even at MIT, I realized quickly that I knew very little, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so I, I really felt like a scientist only as I went through the PhD. Mm. Uh, I had, you know, the way I would ask questions and tackle the literature and it's just different level of depth. And um, a lot of that is I, I credit uh, the, the, you know, kids mentoring and yeah. the, the, that you know, MIT in general for it, for that. Although culturally it was very different from Caltech. So it took me some while. Let's I was going to say the, the switch, the switch from uh, Pasadena to Boston must've been a, oh, I love kind of that one. No, it's that, that one uh, actually uh, East coast is fine. Cause uh, it's just felt like a rhythm I can understand um, mm -hmm. coming from, yes. uh, from Bucharest. But, um, and, and actually really love the city and, and the rhythm, but uh, Caltech and MIT, both institutes of technology, they're a little bit different pace. So I, I should say, I think my first year in grad school, I think, uh, you know, I had the uh, orange hair and purple shoes and honestly, hey. I did not stand out at Caltech at all. I never felt like <laughs> I was a center of attention for that reason in the least, right? I mean, you don't want to know what my, my friends were dressing up <laughs> Oh, okay. so I'm pretty sure one morning at the dining uh, room, uh, one of one of the people, the undergrads was like dressed as a superhero. I was like, oh, what's going on? You know, and he's like, oh, I just woke up this today and felt like dressing up this way. Nobody Fair. would question that. Right. So that was like Caltech. Yeah. And then uh, I, I quickly decided that I'm going to dye my hair back to my normal color, yeah. <laughs> which is not orange. Yeah. And, uh, ditch my purple shoes to just kind of fit in and not draw that kind of attention on me for those reasons. Mm. So, yeah. Those Boston people, they are, they are you know, Boston, New York, they, they would be some tough people up there. I know, I understand. It's, it's different, you know, and I, yeah, I it mean, is. you know, my, I remember, okay, so one of my first classes uh, when I started at MIT was with uh, Steve Lippert, Bioinorganic mm. Chemistry. And of course, I had taken it with Jackie Barton at Caltech, but I, I thought it would be fun to take it as a graduate student. But, you know, it's like a really early class. And I was thinking, oh, no, nothing ever happens in the first day of class, right? <laughs> Well, I, I just kind of skipped the cl the first class. I didn't think much of it. Oh, man. I oh, what an impression. Endorsement for this. But I was like, who cares? No, it's just the first class. So anyway, uh, later that day or maybe that week, um, <laughs> sitting at my desk and doing my rotation with kids and kids group and kid comes by and, you know, he's, he's trying to ask me nicely. He's like, so, Alexandra, are you taking... Uh, Steve's class. Oh no! And I was like, uh, yeah. I was like, yeah. Why? Why? Well, he told me you weren't in class at all. Oh no! <laughs> so I was thinking, how could you possibly know? You know, we've never even met in person. I mean, except maybe for visiting weekends. Yeah. I see things dif differently now as a prof because I, I, I actually am a lot more familiar with the incoming class than perhaps the students realize. Yes. I feel like it's generally true across for like almost all graduate programs. Like people, yeah. professors know. <laughs> exactly. Well, I know. It's kind of funny. I was like, oh, I guess I can't just. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's our first day of Gen Com. It's, it's first day of. Uh... <laughs> yeah. No, that's fun. That is really funny though. He, he's like, he. <laughs> well, I mean, I probably stood out with my orange hair and all, you know. So. Well, that would be fair. <laughs> I think there are like two girls in my class that mm. year. That probably, yeah, didn't help. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, grad school, um, you know, with, uh, professor, uh, Cummins, um, and you kind of doing, I mean, pretty interesting chemistry, kind of making heterocycles with phosphorus and nitrogen, I think, and somewhat yeah. of a, kind of a click reaction. So I don't <laughs> know if you can tell us a little bit about like, kind of, um, oh, yeah, I'd love you know, that. your I, studies. I think that, um, you know, starting with kids group, one of my, the things I really didn't want to do is phosphorus chemistry. Cause I thought, oh, that's just like, way too exotic. I was like, okay, I really want to work with kids, but there's no way I'm going to do, it. this is also me. Just like I was saying, there's no way I would work with tail. I was like, there's no way I will do phosphorus chemistry. <laughs> so I, you know, uh, but anyway, of course I, I ended up working on phosphorus and I love phosphorus. Great element. Um, phosphorus it's great, great element. element it's one of my favorites we actually work on black phosphorus right now which is um the most Ooh. thermodynamically stable allotrope of the element and a van der waals material so think graphene so that's yeah, yeah. research flavors my research deviates quite a bit from what i had done as a, an undergrad a graduate student sure 
or uh, even as a postdoc, but but it all like kind of helped uh, solidify the way I think about science um, and enable us to do what we do today. But but uh, as far as the the work I did as a graduate student, I I, I think it's it's kind of more uh, perhaps uh, useful to hear like how I thought about the project and and how it came about. Right when I started working in Kids Group, um, the project that ended up being my main you know phd dissertation didn't exist and i at least not certainly not in the form that it it, it had taken when when i um when i stumbled upon the this discovery that i'll mm. mention it. um but one thing was clear i spent about a year my first year and a half working on this Niobium, niobium trisodip complexes that are kind of like shuttling phosphorus fragments to different um, receiving units, you know, like uh, organic units or inorganic ones. And so most famously, my colleague, who I share my office wall <laughs> with now, uh, Professor Brandy Cossert, had uh, synthesized using this niobium uh, uh, P3 complex, um, uh, the molecule, the tetrahedral molecule ASP3, so arsenic P3. P3, which is a tetrahedron, and and you know it's it's a really interesting um, uh, internictogen mm -hmm. molecule. So so anyway, I I spent about a year and a half doing quite a bit of work on that. We I had you know a lot of results, and I think we wrote a, a, at least a couple of papers on that eventually. But uh, my I was I was not really excited about it because I felt like there wasn't with my way of approaching the science. I could not see at that time something new and exciting and interesting. And that's sure. just something that I really love doing. I mean, I had started a project that was just a figment of Teo's, you know, creativity and imagination as an undergrad. And I just, I love that, right? I wanted to do something new and exciting and something that I could believe in and that would be interesting. So I was, I had an eye for that. And I remember it was kind of a low point in my PhD because I, I kept working and, you know, I I had results, but they weren't anything too exciting in my mm. books. And probably not in kids' book either, I would guess. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a low point. And I, I remember one late night in the lab, uh, I had run this experiment. I found some compound that actually, I think, probably we had left over from Dan Mendiola's days in kids' yeah. group. <laughs> which was this nitrogen uh, kind of uh, bridging an anthracene molecules in the nine ten position, right? So, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and and uh, it anyway some substituent on nitrogen and maybe I made the lithium salt of that and I thought wouldn't it be cool if I put it on and I make a dichlorophosphine from that for some chemistry and I was like well maybe we can we can make a an anthracene sandwich with PN, um, but that was just sort of a on the side experiment, you know, that I thought it would be cool to try. Uh, so I had mixed magnesium anthracene with this dichlorophosphine, which had this, you know, uh, one of the molecules of interest in the, in the lab, um, longstanding, uh, we had the longstanding interest in this is like a PN molecule, just a dimolecular, think dinitrogen, but instead one nitrogen is replaced by phosphorus, right? So, mm. so finding ways to produce this molecule and study it would just was of fundamental interest and I think still is. So some progress had happened over the past few years on that front. Uh, some yeah. from group. Um, but but anyway, so that was sort of the the context that I was operating in. And uh, I remember being at my desk and I'm chatting with Mike Marshak, who's now a professor as well <laughs> in Colorado. And and uh, where I had just set up this experiment and, you know, he's like, oh, that would be so cool. You know, he, he had seen this also possibility as well of having the PN in between the two anthracenes. And uh, we were just chatting about how cool it would be if that actually happened. And when I was analyzing the data, I see in the baseline, like maybe like 2% of this doublet that was indicative that a phosphorus carbon bond had formed where a basically could have indicated that the bridge of phosphorus bridging between this 910 position of anthracene. Mm. Uh, so an analog of, um, it's like a phosphonorbornadiene, right? Yep. Uh, core had formed. And I, I just thought that was super cool. Like there was, uh, at that night, I wasn't thinking where that that's going to be my PhD thesis, but I was like, okay, I can see this being interesting. And so a couple of days later, I remember we have an electronic notebook, which I recommend to everyone. We also have in my lab an electronic notebook. So Kit could always see our experiments. Um, so he, he comes by and he's like, oh, 
so what's up with these uh, experiments? What's what's going on there? And I was like, oh, I think I made this molecule, you know, with PN bridge between two anthracenes. And it just took a moment and started like the wheels. I could see the wheels started turning. And <sighs> like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> you know, he was a little bit like, I think he was just like kind of questioning, why am I doing going on, on a tangent in some completely different direction? And, and so that's kind of how, it's, how this started. And the reason why this was relevant and uh, interesting is because it was kind of a long-standing question of whether you could generate singlet phosphinidines. And so kind of like singlet carbenes, they could have a lot of interesting relevance in catalysis or just fundamental interest in general in stabilizing low-coordinate phosphorus species. Sure. There was uh, there was no way to produce them. And so one, one thought process was that perhaps if one creates this phosphonorbornadiene framework, upon a thermal release of an aromatic unit, so the anthracene in this case, you would generate the singlet phosphinidine. And uh, we think that does happen. And there was a lot of chemistry that resulted from this new class, what became essentially a class of uh, phosphonorbornadiene, um, you know, uh, phosphorus transfer reagents uh, that uh, that also gave rise to this aromatic, um, I think I have, uh, aromatic like, you know, uh, I, an ion where you have three nitrogens and two phosphorus atoms with a negative charge. So this would be an inorganic aromatic compound that I think what most notably has this, uh, if you imagine these being phosphorus atoms, there's multiple bonding character here between the two phosphorus atoms. And because phosphorus is a heavier element, you don't really expect this double bond to be stable on its own, except that aromaticity stabilizes it enough to enable it to be, you know, crystallized as a salt mm. uh, with this exposed uh, multiple bonded fragment. And that's that's kind of um, cool because it demonstrates a completely different way of, of uh, stabilizing multiple bonding and these heavier elements without steric bulk, something that uh, Phil Power has has long, you know, has um, and others, of course, have have shown to to be possible, where you put really bulky substituents, and that's how you would protect from against catenation or other reactivity, this multiple bonding between heavier um, main group elements. That's really interesting. So, so that was just uh, one one of the aspects why this was was interesting, but uh, but others as well, um, in, including this just the ease of which you could uh, you could transfer or in, insert phosphorus into organic molecules. Actually, I'm really still interested in that class of compounds, but um, perhaps in the future we'll return to, to uh, using them in, in, uh, in my group now. Sure. But that, uh, yeah, that was the arc of how it started. And, you know, once I graduated, m many people have been working on that project. Something that is also really rewarding to see and something that has happened in Till's group as well. Like I, I had started the project and, you know, that's still going, <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, that, was, that was very rewarding to see. Yeah, out of curiosity, how do you like synthesize these compounds? And because I've only, um, I mean, to make some phosphine ligands here in our group, like I've worked with like PCL3, but I'm really kind of unfamiliar, let's say, with like diphosphorus or um, any, like, I don't know where to get the nitrogen sources from. So generally, like, what are you, what are kind of your starting materials? And also um, maybe tell us yeah. just a little bit how it's like synthesized. Like, I don't, like, what's the... Sure, the, the, so I think the important entry point here is the 7-phosphonorbornadiene fragment. Again, this was also important because there were uh, people in the literature, to, as another a word of caution here, that were literally writing in papers like this framework could never be stable at phosphorus. This was just because it will of this retrobiles all there that right. would happen. So there, we actually quoted this in our first paper on this. Uh, on this uh, that absolutely. It is possible. It's just you need the anthracene there or perhaps something else as well. So never say never. But the way we approached making the phosphorus carbon bonds, so between uh, uh, you know phosphorus and the anthracene nine ten positions there is um, so de aromatizing that yeah um, that middle um, ring in, in anthracene is um, via it's actually really simple, which is why this is so powerful um, using magnesium anthracene. Um, which is a, a reagent long known, um, yeah, and uh, and and uh, various dichlorophosphines. I okay. think that the ones that had worked initially and the best were the ones that contained an amino group on them, so alkyl amino dichlorophosphine or something like that. Yeah, 
Of course, it's, also the, the one with, with anthracene on the nitrogen, uh, yeah. which was kind of a cool entry point in this whole foray. But it is it is true. I was I was uh, chatting with Dan Mendiola after this, and he's like, you know, I actually tried the reaction like this when I was a grad student, but it didn't work. Because, you know, it, the, I kind of got lucky because the... The, when I ran that first experiment, I happened to run it with a with a dichlorophosphine that was an, and at the temperature and in the solvent that gave me even if it was just two percent yield, you know, of the initial product, which had you know had been optimized afterwards to a lot more than that. Um, but just in that first reaction, like uh, you know, I kind of got lucky to to run the reaction in the conditions that would enable me to observe the productive chemistry, and then I could go after it. And you know, try to maximize the yield and things like that. Sure. Once we had the proof of concept, so um, yeah. It how did you make with all that? How, how, how did you make? How do you make the the? Oh my god, the nitrogen the nitrogen heterocycle. What do you take diphosphorus and like sodium azide and just mix them? Oh no, well, <laughs> yeah. Know. So diphosphorus is, is a is a really cool molecule that exists in like exoplanets, for example. So places places in space where you have the right temperature, so high temperatures and low pressure, so that the fo- you know the phosphorus molecules would not catenate. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the multiple bonding and at phosphorus is is less stable with respect to catenation, right? Than for example for lighter elements like nitrogen we don't have uh, nitrogen nitrogen chains propagating but we do have phosphorus <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, phosphorus phosphorus bonds catenating like that and they're more stable so in the lab though to make diphosphorus is not trivial and that's one of the things that um somebody uh prior in kit's lab had done so uh nick piero and josh figueroa while they were graduate students came up with a with a niobium-based platform, similar to the one I mentioned prior, uh, that would essentially expulge uh, like P2 mm-hmm. as you heat them up. My route was a little bit um, different because it instead of having this niobium trisodip platform or uh, trisanolide platform, actually, um, it, it, it just had anthracene. Mm. So I was able to, to take a dichlorophosphine uh, and you know, make this seven phosphonorbornadiene architecture, and uh, eventually access um, a chlor. So put a, a chloride on the phosphorus. Yep. So now we have this molecule that has only like the phosphorus atom bound to a chloride, and then the, the phosphorus atom bound to this anthracene unit, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, it turns out that in the presence of Lewis acids like aluminum trichloride, this isomerizes. You can form a phosphorus phosphorus bond, something that is precedented for other chlorophosphine compounds. There's a lot of beautiful work out there, um, and so I kind of suspected that a phosphorus phosphorus bond might form. But what I didn't suspect is that it would rearrange in this beautiful way that produced um, essentially an architecture where where two um, uh, so where the anthracene is bridged by two phosphoruses that are also bound to another anthracene. So it's like a P2 sandwiched between two anthracenes. Mm. And, um, and you know, th- this is isolated initially as a, as a salt because there's still a halide on the phosphorus. But then upon reduction, you could get this very simple molecule that is literally two anthracenes and a P2 unit in between. So if you look at that, you can immediately think, well, OK, you have two good leaving groups. The aromatization, um, uh, sorry, the uh, the aromatization of the two anthracenes upon uh, you know cleaving the phosphorus carbon bonds, which are themselves pretty strained, would lead to the P two unit um, in in theory, right? Yeah. So uh, we 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 have done some experiments in collaboration with my uh, former colleague Matt Nava and the field group at MIT, uh, and and to probe that that actually does happen and that P2 is observed in the gas phase upon heating up this P2 bisanthracine sandwich. So um, so because we, we suspected that this P2 unit could be produced in solution as well, and a lot of kinetic work that I had done as a graduate student, which was... Uh, was a really cool but very difficult kind of foray to, to, to kind of figure out for me at the time, um, had had uh, supported this idea that P2 is formed in solution upon the thermal decay of this molecule. Um, we, we thought that we could trap it with various molecules. Mm. And so one way to, if, if you look at the P2 molecule that contains in principle a triple bond between the two phosphorus atoms. And so, um, 
uh, there's an analogy, chem a chemical analogy between phosphorus and carbon. So we thought, okay, well, if alkynes uh, undergo click chemistry, then perhaps so would uh, P2. And it, and it did. And that's how the P2 and 3 and ion came about. That's really. Uh, so that was. But that was yeah. that was sort of the pinnacle of of all these studies, and just one sure. uh, beautiful illustration of the reactivity and con you know the uh, approach, the simple approach for uh, delivering low coordinate fr phosphorus fragments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there, you know, I think the the project uh, has legs and and could could continue to go. And and since the graduation, of course, uh, it, it has continued to grow, but I, I think it still has a lot of potential to lead to interesting chemistry. Sure. Especially, yeah, especially, for sure. So transitioning then from graduate school to postdoc, um, you know, you did a postdoc um, at, um, at Columbia, Columbia, that's right, yeah, at, at Columbia with uh, Professor uh, Knuckles. And uh, I guess a, a question was, you know, again, was postdoc kind of natural progression then? I mean, obviously you had, uh, you were fascinated by the research. So, I mean, my impression then is that it was kind of a, kind of an easy decision, but I don't know. I don't know. Like what was kind of the, the uh, thinking? You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I see things very differently now when I know mm. how, how it costs to hire a postdoc and how, but back then I was like, well, of course I'm going to do a postdoc. So I, I, as I said, I, I kind of had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do with my life and, and that worked out for me. Um, I think the difficulty was to find a group that I thought would be a good fit. And um, I already knew, to me, you know, the work I did with with uh, Teo, for example, with this airing groups that were stabilizing metal fragments on the surface, to me, that looked like a surface. You know, I was thinking, okay, if you squint, you could imagine this might happen on a surface, yeah. for example, right? Or the reactivity, and that's, that was also very much the case with the anthracene unit that was reacting to you know, to to uh, stabilize these low coordinate phosphorus fragments, and so if you squint, you could think, oh, maybe that was going to happen on on graphene. And so I really wanted to do surface chemistry on on two dimensional materials because of this. Uh, so I was already uh, thinking about that. But as I looked around um, with, you know, uh, at the time, I I just couldn't identify many groups at least in the U.S., that were, were doing exactly the kind of stuff I was really interested in. And um, actually, we are doing the stuff I wanted to do back then, right now in my group, right? So these, we, we are doing exactly... You've made um, it. Actually, maybe it's a proposal, <laughs> uh, for better or worse, I guess. This is our research program now are pretty much my research proposals, like to ridiculous uh, level of fidelity. Um, and that's because, you know, it... it, it, it I had been thinking about it in some capacity, even passively for a long time, right? Sure. Um, and, and so um, when I, I I saw Colin's work and I I thought that his approach to chemistry was just so creative. You know, the the guy has, has spanned. I mean, I think he, he likes to say that he, he wants to put molecules in electronics. Or I love that. But if you look at the kind of the ways in which he's approached this uh, this goal, it's uh, it's really inspiring. I mean, some work on surfaces, a lot of work on carbon, of course, and various uh, poly aromatics, um, and and then also Fourier clusters, and so many collaborations uh, with you know with people that would enable this vision. And I I wanted to to see how that's done. It's it's very different from the way traditionally in organic chemistry in organic chemistry, uh, in my opinion, was approached, uh, you know, the places I had been exposed to the most. Mm. Uh, so, so I thought it's a very forward looking way to yep. science. And, and I was not wrong. You know, this is the one thing that I was most grateful to see at Columbia. And I think that UW pro uh, provides that as well, that, mm. that way of approaching science. It's very, I think, in that same rhythm of thinking about science and approaching it that's very interdisciplinary like in my group right now we work with uh, we're enabled to do and ask like sometimes crazy questions um and i think uh, because we can work with condensed matter physicists and engineers at the same time we have we can do high level inorganic chemistry with a very molecular flavor to it so it's it's a you know my experience at Columbia has really catalyzed uh, us being able to do that and and um, although I didn't do that work hands on I was able to be as a MERSEC postdoc um, 
at Columbia, I was able to see how that's done. And, you know, we were in close contact to people who were condensed matter physicists or working with two dimensional materials. And, you know, um, I was able to ask questions. And as I was thinking about my proposals, and we do work with two dimensional materials in my group as well, um, and to see how could you forge those kind of collaborations and uh, have them grow, because it, you know, I, I kind of come out of the left field in this in this space, sure. and uh, never worked in that space. And so that comes with its own challenges. And so having an idea of uh, of, of how others do it uh, gave me the confidence that over time I could I could uh, foster those kind of collaborations in the right space. And so UW has been wonderful at providing those kind of uh, opportunities to to work with uh, like minded people that you know. And we have our own Mersec Center at Columbia, uh, uh, sorry at, at UW, and I'm still collaborating with with um, a physics contingent at at Columbia actually. Or you know, trying to to show my the importance of molecular inorganic chemistry to that right. uh, contingent of people. Right. So. That, I, one thing I will say is kind of just on the topic is I never like, realized how the let's say the opportunity for knowledge and like the opportunity for like it sounds obvious, but the opportunity for science like really is like within like graduate school and postdoctoral research. Like it, like it's just it's actually unimaginable how like deep it could go. Um, and like the brilliant work that's being done out there is just, is it's actually, it's literally mind boggling, like how much, um, there is to do just, just on your, your, your postdoctoral research, just a little bit, um, for the viewers, I know you were working on like kind of, uh, uh, like chalk, chalcogen, right? Like clusters and kind of like the nanostructures. I guess what I'm curious about is maybe to provide a little bit of nuance to that, but also, because I'm I'm curious, what is like the day to day like? I, what is the day to day for like this kind of work? Like I don't really I know I know that's not I get um, that you're doing uh, a lot of science. Do you is, mean is like, different? Maybe it might be easier to to answer this question with respect to our research group uh, mm. than my limited experience as a postdoc, right? That's the thing. When you're a PI, you can see many different facets of of a research program. So I can yeah. perhaps. Answer that question. Would that be okay? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so the day to day is very different in my lab. I think that that's kind of unusual. I think, and, and perhaps um, that's going to change in the future, and it might. Um, but but as far as inorganic chemistry labs go, our lab is um, is really diverse in terms of the questions it tackles, and that means the day to day varies a lot. So, mm. for example, on the more relatable to an inorganic molecular chemist front. You know, we uh, we have a group of people that make clusters. These are molecules. So anything that you would think molecules, you know, mo work in the molecular space entails, uh, you could probably you would probably guess right in terms of characterization techniques. You know, you mix two reagents in a vial, take an NMR, try to grow crystals, uh, and and more sophisticated measurements from there. You know, electrochemistry. UV vis, et cetera, et cetera. But these are all fairly standard um, kind of ways to probe molecules with. Maybe sometimes we do some fancier x-rays, but anyway, it's uh, it's synthesis and characterization, of course. Uh, but I think that's that's a little bit uh, easier to to relate to if you're a molecular chemist. Sure, yeah. But at the same time, sense to me. You, know, you can set up, <laughs> as far as the, the pace of the research, right, you could set up a couple of experiments in the morning, analyze them, and by the end of the day, you might know whether the reaction worked. Perhaps you're doing a, you know, you're tracking catalysis or you're doing some mechanistic work, but it's still generally in the same um, umbrella of techniques. Uh, NMR might be uh, heavily, very prominent, even as our compounds are paramagnetic, we rely a lot on it. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot of uh, mix things together and then do a solvent workup, purify compounds, interpret, rethink, et cetera. Mm. But on, uh, we also work with materials, in particular two-dimensional materials. And one that we have done um, work that is in the literature already on is black phosphorus. And it's, yep. again, phosphorus is, uh, is, I think, is just such a cool element and has so much potential. And of course, phosphenes are really important ligands in catalysis. So we thought the black phosphorus surface, which is severely understudied, um, could provide 
uh, these lone pairs of like these phosphines uh, to to uh, function as as supports for catalytic centers, um, and and uh, on that front, you know, we again I would say that there's a bifurcation of uh, techniques. You might uh, work in solution or on single flakes. So. Let me start with a single flakes first, because that's something that a condensed matter physicist would do. Um, you grow crystals. That's a solid. Uh, that's a that's a furnace where you can you know put your starting materials. You like have a quartz uh, ampule, and you know you can grow these beautiful uh, laminar crystals of of the material. And just like uh, Gaiman Novoselov did in you know 2005, we can take the scotch tape to these beautiful crystals and exfoliate layer by layer um, this material, all the way up to atomically thin layers. Although with black phosphorus, we generally do slightly thicker layers. Like okay. it could be range, but it could be like three layers, four layers, etc., and all the way up to bulk, right? But then now you have these flakes that are supported on, for example, silicon oxide or silicon with a silicon oxide coating wafers, and that's your compound that you work with, right? Now, the the reason why this is a cool, like you can imagine, this is a very different pace of research compared to somebody who does synth uh, ligand synthesis, for example. Yes. Now, you know, you <laughs> do optical I... microscopy, check with AFM, with all sorts of fancy spectroscopies and microscopies. And, and, you know, you can take this wafer and now, in a sense, synthetically, this is the easiest thing you can do because you can take this, put it in a vial and treat it with whatever reagent you want. So synthetically, this is really easy. Mm. What is difficult is actually the characterization. Just because you do a reaction, well, then that's true in molecular uh, in the molecular world as well. But once you have this wafer treated with something, how do you know what you made? That's a very difficult question to answer. And so we have to get clever. And in my group, we kind of blend our expertise as molecular scientists to, to figure that out. So mm. um, we might do isotopic labeling and, you know, but, but strictly on the wafer size, like one thing that this enables us to do is incorporate them in devices. So we could put electrodes on, measure current, measure all sorts of fancy optical properties uh, in a device form. And that we do uh, with our partners and collaborators. Um, so we can get uh, information about the, the electronic structure at a whole different level and within that layer and how surface chemistry alters it. Mm. And in the middle ground, you could take these beautiful crystals and instead of exfoliating them with scotch tape, you could try to exfoliate them in solution. And that's our bulk black phosphorus sort of yeah. kind of approach it in the work. And I'm smiling when I say um, bulk, because in the end, you still get very little material, but you can take these crystals, you sonicate them for like a long time, maybe 24 hours or longer, get some some mix of exfoliated nanosheets in solution, the interlayer strength, you know, forces that hold the black phosphorus layers together, um, which look like this are pretty strong. So they are very sticky to one another, that's to say. That's not true for all two-dimensional materials. Um, but once they are in solution, we can do chemistry with them and imagine that they are kind of like molecules and even try to uh, characterize them like molecules. So I was mentioning earlier isotopic labeling. If say, Imagine if you put, uh, which we did, let's say you wanted to uh, do a Staudinger reaction on the black phosphorus surface. This is, then you could have a, you would form a phosphorus nitrogen double bond. And if you have uh, an N15 there, then you could look at IR and, you know, figure out whether you could uh, selectively, um, uh, you know, probe and um, see that, that PN stretch, and mm -hmm. which we do. And so that's just one way in which we can, uh, we can probe the bonding on the surface, but we also put metals, and then there's a whole slew of characterization techniques that, for which the workflow is just so different. You know, you you might need to rely on XFs <laughs> measurements or SDEM or uh, very expensive ways of probing surfaces, but also informative. So you're mm -hmm. kind of losing a little bit of the atomic precision, but that's that's one of the compromises that you have to negotiate uh, once you are in the space of materials. And so um, you it's not going to be an Avogadro number of species sure. the same identity like yeah. in molecular uh in the molecular world on on the black phosphorus do you have to worry about making like 
phosphorus oxides at all? Like, is it kind of robust though, or is yeah, that's the the most. Uh, so, so I should say first that black phosphorus is a lot more stable than uh, I think many people imagine it to be because it's related to white phosphorus, which is a uh, of course a compound that catches on fire, you know, in air. So black phosphorus does not do that, um, okay. but it does undergo kind of a slow burn, you know. So it's in fact oxidation of black phosphorus is uh, is probably the most studied um, reaction on black phosphorus. Mm. Um, one of the reasons for this is because, well, um, a lot of physicists have uh, uh, developed an interest in black phosphorus for its interesting electronic and physical properties. It's a direct uh, mid mid IR band gap um, semiconductor. Uh, so, uh, you know, it has an isotropic transport. It has all these very, uh, very good uh, carrier mobility. So um, it has a lot of really attractive uh, physical characteristics and unique. But at the same time, um, if you are a condensed matter physicist, you'd rather perhaps not work with something that is uh, uh, so... Uh, that could oxidize in air. Mm. Although that, I mean, they can handle that as well, of course. It's just a little bit harder to do um, because you might be looking at a single layer of a compound. And so if, if uh, over time, you know, you start forming phosphorus oxides and, you know, you absorb water, of course, you know, phosphorus oxides are, are very hydrophilic. So, you know, you eventually make phosphoric acid, then, then that just compromises the experiments. And, and uh, so, so it does make it harder to work with. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, general, I mean, again, I'm not familiar with kind of this, uh, inorganic, uh, heterogeneous catalysis type material science at all. Um, but what certain advantages does, does the black phosphorus, let's say, have over like, I don't know, like other, let's say surfaces or, um, how other yeah. heterogeneous materials work as well. Like I'm not, I'm not really well versed in this area at all. Um, but I'm curious. Yeah. Well, so, so, uh, from an industrial point of view, probably we certainly haven't demonstrated that the black phosphorus would provide an edge um, because, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of making money, you want something scalable, yeah, yeah. And easy to work with. And it's like the Haber Bosch process. And it's my deep opinion that we're not going to be shaking the infrastructure for that uh, for a very long time to come. Right. If you, if you will, the Haber Bosch right? process. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's right. So, so um, it's it's like that with a lot of heterogeneous catalysts. Oftentimes, these are anchored on uh, metal oxides. Mm. But of course, in a university setting, you can ask uh, questions that could be interesting for other reasons. I of mean, course, even yeah. so, with all with all the the trial and error strategy, that is generally the way that heterogeneous catalysts that are industrially relevant are being uh, made. That's just so you try various conditions and some of them produce the compound you want you, you know that that's been pretty successful but it, it's not really solving our uh more pressing you know sustainability related questions about converting carbon dioxide to other you know to <laughs> uh to, to you know to more commodity carbon. yeah like so something, something that that is not uh, bad for the environment but that's just one example mm -hmm. so i think uh, academically, we can we can look at uh, processes that are relevant to what it takes to, for example, tackle um, two things in particular that we think a lot about, which is uh, the uh, fidelity of how the active sites looks like on mm. a surface. And so, for that reason, we think that um, you know a, a surface like that of black phosphorus, which has fewer defects because it has fewer dangling bonds, would provide a really interesting platform to uh, to probe this question of can you achieve site fidelity and anchor active sites onto this canvas that is fairly pristine. Mm. Um, the second one is the interaction between the substrate and the active site. So um, uh, although I think no support is truly inert, they do participate in catalysis in some, in some ways, um, you know, something that is um, in a more obvious way, chemically non-innocent, like black phosphorus, not just in terms of electron uh, transfer, but also coordination. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit more, uh, I think, tractable to imagine how that might happen. And so studying something on the black phosphorus canvas could provide uh, advantages in terms of uh, asking um, 
asking a question and being able to experimentally probe it. Whereas in right. very complex structures, that that's uh, it's not impossible naturally, but it, yeah, it remains yeah. a great challenge just because of the, the landscape is so complex and there's mm -hmm. so many things happening all at once. Not that that wouldn't necessarily happen on Black Phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, I also, of course, as a as a having the the luxury of being working at the university, I think that. You know, Black Phosphorus is just such an interesting platform. It's a, a Van der Waal it's a material, but it's an allotrope. So, you know, we graphene is an analog allotrope material of carbon. Carbon and phosphorus have a lot of analogies. Structurally, of course, uh, Black Phosphorus and graphene are very different. But, but you know... There's so much to learn there that we have no idea about. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think, I think that my group is in a unique position to answer these questions in a sure. sophisticated way. And, and uh, that's another thing to consider, right? We, I'm not competing with a, with a, a heterogeneous catalysis company. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to uh, maximize the chances that we do interesting work at the frontier. Right. With the resources that are that I have, you mm -hmm. know, with the students and infrastructure and funding that we have here. So to me, the question is, how can I ask the most interesting questions um, and create directions that I'm both fascinated by, but that are I can stand behind to say, OK, this is this is a new thing. It's it's keeps me excited and interested and. And if I figure this out, I'll know that I'll add something to that wasn't there before in in a more um, perhaps obvious way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important to me to consider, and that's why black phosphorus I think is especially fascinating and it's an yeah. allotrope. Yeah. Well, the beauty—I mean, the beauty of it is like you, you know you're given the platform opportunity to answer like some of these fundamental questions. Honestly, that just for you know I think that's right. what I think kind of excellent. Is black phosphorus exactly. And so um, Phosphines are really important ligands. So, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, hopefully we, we can be surprised at what we find. That's the best, right? When you can discover something that you didn't necessarily predict. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, and you're, yeah. these interesting questions for just for this, the sake of it being interesting, I think is it's always unique for, for chemistry for that reason, I think. Uh, that's kind of the beauty of the chemistry. It's like you can just ask these questions and, you know, you do have the platform to, to go answer these things. Um, I'm sure your students are also great for the ability to have a phosphorus and a MAR too. I'm sure that's also great as well. Oh, you would think, but actually, actually, uh, if only that was uh, easier to do. Oh, is it not true? Uh, okay, I know. <laughs> yeah. So our uh, professor Aaron Rossini has helped us acquire some solid state phosphorus and MR, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not. No, sadly, we, is my impression not... wrong? Okay, because I work, I work at Foster and the Mars all the time for like ligand, ligand yeah. design. So I'm like, I'm we major... do as well, just not for the Black Phosphorus project. Okay, I, I see. Mean, we, we have this collaboration with the Rossini Lab that um, hopefully will, you know, continue and we can demonstrate its utility and probing bonding and more interesting questions on Black Phosphorus in the future. Mm. But for now, I think it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's not as. Uh, a democratic of a technique that uh, you know it is and has served us uh, in in other projects, including on the cluster side, where even as the clusters are paramagnetic, the phosphorus and MR is amazingly informative on the electronic structure. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm excited to see you know what what comes out in the next few years on on black phosphorus and your 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 research in that area. But you know another part of your research area is you know heterogeneous catalysis using you know was it iron, selenium, cobalt type. Uh, heterogeneous uh, to do single site catalysts to do you know take things like nitrogen and co2 to more let's say um commodity items for like ammonia or carbon carbon bond products That's and uh you know i i would love to you know kind of get your um well hear from you on this area of research in your, in your group i think it's i think it's super fascinating mm -hmm. So um, it, it, to me, I see this as a continuous uh, endeavor. Uh, the black phosphorus provides us an actually sur an actual surface. Uh, mm. it's, a, it's truly heterogeneous, right? So we're we're tackling some face of the the problem. The problem, for example, of achieving site fidelity on a surface and um, making sure that we also have some control over uh, how those are produced and 
have the confidence that our experimental techniques are actually probing the reality of what happens on the surface. These are challenges associated with working on materials and surfaces. Um, on the, at the other side of the spectrum, uh, we devised something that is kind of a molecule, but a molecule that is more complex than, than traditionally, uh, I think, than many have been in the past to uh, emulate surfaces. And so they kind of take a, a cluster, which is just a, an, an aggregate of a few elements, a handful of elements, and we kind of view it as a small uh, functional unit to serve as um as a uh, as a support mm -hmm. and then we thought um that we could well i should that these could serve as, as surface models uh for what happens on our true surface and i want to take a moment here to say that this comes in a context this idea that clusters could serve as models for surfaces uh, is not a new thing. I Muturities mean, and so many others have uh, have flirted with this idea and have proposed it. But the reality is that um, in general, although not completely true for all clusters out there, the, the clusters that had been produced, many of them, right, that there are entire libraries of clusters, including the one we use and that I worked with as a postdoc, this cobalt selenide um, chevrolet type, you know, building block. Uh, it, it's... Um, it hasn't really led to a lot of productive catalytic chemistry, and they mm. haven't in general led to that. Um, I mean, obviously, if you think of gold clusters or, or things like that, then, then there's a lot of catalysis going on there. The challenges are different. You generally, anyway, not to get into the challenges in that particular area. So this, I, we, we too became fascinated with this idea that clusters could serve as model for surfaces, but it was really important for us to actually have the functionality portion figured out. and. And to do that, we just took a very simple twist, I think, to to a theme that had existed, you know, making the clusters, their entire libraries, you can make them at scale. But in general, the, the surface sites are capped by ligands that bind quite strongly in this size regime. Hmm. Like as you get larger, the clusters get larger, the bonds with the surfactants or the ligands on the surface get weaker so they can dissociate. And that's a different regime altogether. And now you're in the real not nano size. Um, but when the clusters are fairly small, so you're still in a molecular range, the bonds to the ligands are strong and they actually have an uh, increased impact on the reactivity. So then we posited that, um, and this was part of my research proposals when I started at the University of Washington, that, um, well, let's just solve that problem by simply placing, kind of like we would on the black phosphorus surface or on another support, uh, low coordinate metals or metals in a protected low coordinate state on the cluster surface. And this way we could achieve two things. And, you know, this idea of active sites has been, you know, that, that they are in protected low coordinate states and that therefore can undergo catalysis has long been known and, you know, in the heterogeneous catalysis. So we just wanted to place them on a, on a system that is easy to characterize in, in a molecular regime, but that still engulfs some complexities of a surface. So on our clusters, we, have the ability to place not one, but multiple active sites, which are identical in a first coordination state. And we do that via ligand design. So we just have an anchoring point on the cluster surface that kind of tethers a metal that can now uh, coordinate in a reversible manner to the exposed calcogens. Uh, so that's why we, we started off by looking at seleniums. We thought that those would be soft enough that the metal might be able to you know, land on it and, and detach from it to engage with substrates. And we were right in that assumption. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that over the past few years. So that was cool because although these are molecules, they can in inform on this very important uh, interface that is very hard to study in heterogeneous systems. And there are lots of unanswered questions as to what happens at this frontier, at the interface between the active site and the support. How are electrons and charges mediated at this interface? How is this uh, you know, push-pull effect between ligands binding or substrates binding and being activated and the interaction with the active site and then the interaction between the active site and the rest of the inorganic support? So we can actually capture these interactions in great detail on the surface and just unprecedented um, de uh, detail and extract information about this metal support interaction. And uh, that was really cool. And the, but and this creates a platform for another question that we 
became quite fascinated by, which is the Alice theory that occurs when you have multiple active sites. And mm-hmm. when you're in a surface, it, I mean, sure, it's possible that your active sites are isolated, maybe even likely, depending on the system. But when the active sites are close enough together, and that will depend on how close uh it will depend on the actual how close is close enough right right Right. i mean like copper for example copper metal might be different than iron sulfide right yeah yeah sure so um so then when when the metals are close enough together that you can actually capture allosteric happening between them or as a solid state chemist might say interadsorbate effects then you can start to really uncover the dynamics of uh, you know that that uh, weave the reactivity of multiple active sites neighboring sites together and that's also unprecedented it's not something that has been previously um you know, looked at with atomic level detail, and we are able to capture in this sort of smallest unit of uh, of uh, active site support kind of combination in our molecular clusters. Even if they're still molecules, they can capture this complexity of allosteric or uh, interadsorbate effects, and and um, and because our clusters are catalytically active, we can actually put this in the. Con- it's not just a structural model and. I'm not a big fan of stru- the structural fidelity dogma, which has, I think, um, been very prominent in, in organic chemistry in general, uh, looking at the structural mimics of, of things, whether it's bioinorganic constructs or heterogeneous uh, surfaces. But I think that it's more important to look at the functional, uh, at functional models, things that actually <laughs> have a function so you can study phenomena mm. that are interesting. Um, so that's that's something we keep in mind as we uh, approach our structures. And so yes, we uh, we are looking forward in the next phase of our research program to to uh, uncover reactivity that is you know um, increasingly complex and and interesting. Right. But for now, we we've, we've uncovered these phenomena that occur um, at the interface between the active site and the support, and between multiple active sites mm. through the support. Are you able to just because again, I'm not. This is not an area of research I'm really familiar with at all. So, um, you know, can you explain a little bit what is difficult about studying this? Like, obviously, these questions I guess have been posed for a long time, but it's like, you know, why is it so difficult? And then what are the kind of the instruments that you're able to do that probe these kind of, let's say, mechanistic mm-hmm. questions? Really, I suppose. Um, oh, yes, of course. Um, I should say that. Well, difficult is all relative, right? With Fair. relative to the tools you have at your disposal. So I I have to say that it's difficult to probe this on a surface because of the heterogeneity of the surface. Mm. So imagine now you have a perfect surface like this one is, would depict. Obviously, the black phosphorus surface is not going to be as pristine as this 3D printed model or you know 3D model of the black phosphorus surface. There has all sorts of defects so, which com- complicate the reactivity. But let's imagine for a second you could actually get 100% active site fidelity across the surface. You still have to have um, spectroscopic tools and x-ray tools to like probe what happens here. You can't just go and take an NMR uh, necessarily. Perhaps you could for some materials, but point is that a lot of different kind of spectroscopies are required to probe what happens in a heterogeneous system. And mm. the reality is that you don't have perfect systems. They are not molecules. So you'll have holes and, you know, defects of all types that are going to uh, perhaps obscure what you observe. So what you look at in the heterogeneous system is an aggregate effect generally. It's a collective um, outcome. And you have to deconvolute it into various processes that might occur there. And because of this, it's very hard to get atomistic insights into that. It's not impossible. Some of my favorite studies, um, you know, look at various STM <laughs> measurements on single flakes, and you can actually see things moving on there. Okay, that's great, but it's not something that every lab can do the way that NMR might be accessible even at an undergraduate institution, whereas, <laughs> you know, STM is not absolutely available everywhere. It, it, so, or the expertise, et cetera. So, so, so you know, the ability to probe questions and get atomic insights on on a material is just intrinsically challenged by the heterogeneity of the material and the mm. the um, instrumental probes available to to look at surface science and these have evolved a lot but you know it's still not at the level of a ripe 
field like that of molecular techniques. Sure. Um, so I think that's why it's difficult to get atomistic insights there. Um, on the on the molecular mimics front, I think that the challenges are different, and that stem more from having the right platform to answer questions. So you have to construct again, and I'll repeat myself here. I think it's really important here to look at functional models as opposed to structural ones. I mean, if you can have a structurally um, identical or you know a structural model of something that is uh, in a, an excerpt of a larger structure, and you know that's also performing the function mm -hmm. of the material, that would be amazing, right? But generally, that doesn't happen. So you're just Asking different questions, I think. And um, and to be honest, I also don't know that the questions that we are after were necessarily um, at the forefront of everybody's minds to be able to look at, right? So we, I think they are, but they're just different communities that are asking, you know, these kind of questions. And so it depends on what side of the spectrum you are and how you approach, what, what your tools available to you are to answer the question. So difficulties are different across um, uh, su subfields or like the place of the world where you are. I mean, and I mean, place of the world is in your expertise and uh, resources available to you. Mm -hmm. Now, from what you've kind of studied so far and what you've been learning over the past few years, is there a kind of, um, I, I don't want to say takeaways or conclusions because I mean, you know, it's, this is still like, this is an ever going thing, but are there kind of any takeaways for um, people to um, kind of, um, I guess, hold on to for now um, as you keep venturing into this area or? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, on a scientific front, what have we learned and where do we want to go next? Or Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. Um, so I think, I, you know, this is such an important question. And I think especially at this point in our, uh, in, in the life of my graduate, of my, of my research group is, is an excellent one to ask, right? What's the next frontier? And, um, for us, I think we've, uh, we've demonstrated some important things that we set out to demonstrate, um, e explicitly. It wasn't, I mean, there was some serendipity, but mostly it was, it was, a on a, on a blueprint that we already thought had thought deeply about, so we, we demonstrated the, the fact that this approach of putting active sites on nanosheets like black phosphorus or on clusters is a productive way to study phenomena that might occur and be relevant to uh, heterogeneous catalysts or, you know, other, for other reasons that we, uh, we might be looking at, for example, two-dimensional materials that we didn't discuss in this particular, that don't relate to heterogeneous catalysis. Um, but... But I think that as we go into this uh, next phase of our research group, it is really critical to think about the utility of the transformation. So we, we studied the phenomena and we have some good idea of the, the rules guiding, for example, allosteri or metal support interactions. We've come up with the rules of the game and extracted extracted them from systems that are still quite complex. So that was not trivial to do. but we have a way to, to think about it and systematize it, right? We want just a, at least a starting point model to comprehend uh, what's going on and what are the factors that influence catalysis with respect to these two, um, two points. But it, it is really important that we now innovate and think about how can we leverage this knowledge, this mechanistic knowledge and structural knowledge and, and uh, into into tackling interesting reactivity. So that is the, the, the next, um, you know, challenge that we set for ourselves. And there are different ways to go about this, you know, I, and I think it's, um, it's not an easy thing necessarily to answer because there's a lot of creative work going out there. And again, we are such, we are a small group. We have few resources. Um, and so we have to be smart in how we, even smarter, <laughs> let's just say everybody has to do that, but we have to be very economical even on mm. how we approach the questions uh, since, since, you know, we have few people and, and all that. So, so yeah, that, that's going to be, we, we have some ideas about how to, how to tackle this to still be innovative. Yeah. Um, and that's what we are after next. So yeah. it could be uh, the kind of reactivity we do, uh, whether it's, 
catalysis or material synthesis is also really important because we want to generate um, uh, bespoken you know s systems that are atomically precise with with uh, tunable functions at our active sites or uh, of, of the materials we produce mm -hmm. so yeah well, the, the functionality is certainly the the key thing here now that we we have made some headway on demonstrating uh, the the proof of concept yep well professor Vellian, i want to thank you so much for joining us on the on the podcast today it was a it, it was a pleasure talking with you and yeah i'm excited to see well both the black phosphorus um what comes out next and uh your the what else comes out of the the uh, single site heterogeneous catalysis I, i'm super excited for it um to see what you know where this goes next um so it's a very exciting time to be in your research lab and at the university of washington again i'm also um over the next few years i'm, I'm excited to see what happens with the chemistry frontiers and kind of you know how that kind of turns out statistically i'm really excited to see like what what you're able to learn from that um because that's all really exciting um but i want to thank you you know for coming on today and you know hope uh hope to see, you know see what see what comes next thanks so much aiden it was really a pleasure and uh you know as we're approaching uh, the end of the year uh, you know i want to really um wish you Happy holidays. Thank you. Yeah. Or we'll see you in person soon. Yeah. Hopefully, um, yeah. Hopefully, I catch you at a conference. That'll be extremely fun, uh, I think. So thanks a lot. Yeah, of course. Well, for everyone out there, um, happy holidays. We're recording this on the 23rd of December. So, or 22nd. So, happy holidays, everyone. And then, you know, we'll see you in 2024, I suppose. So, thank you. All righty.